This video will deal with the concept of Six Sigma. We'll start with, logically enough, the introduction. But before we do that, I want to point out that the number of slides here is quite significant. You'll see from the bottom right-hand corner of this slide that we're on slide 2 of 116. So it's quite a, a detailed video and therefore I suggest that you stop the video from time to time, have a break, have a rest, note where you've got to on the video and return to it and uh, pick it up from there. Uh, it is a lengthy video and it is detailed so it's worth having pen and paper, stopping the video, making your own notes, um, considering the points that have been mentioned and moving on with the video. But really it's a video you need to consider in different visits to the video. You should not consider doing this video all in one. It's, it's detailed and it is lengthy as you can see 116 slides. Having said that let's let's now move to the introduction proper. Um, <coughs> business process management monitors processes so as to minimize waste and increase customer satisfaction. That's the, the purpose of business process management. It's to minimize waste and increase customer satisfaction. It attempts to increase performance and decrease performance variation. So we're looking at internal processes, looking at production within companies. Um, we're looking at ways in which the performance of the, the company may be improved and we're trying to find ways in which performance variation may be reduced because sometimes companies perform very well other times it doesn't go so well so it's trying to deal with that variation trying to reduce the variation and also increase the performance increase the productivity increase the output increase the throughput um, and this will lead to better customer satisfaction the customers will get a better product more consistent product better quality delivered on time. So business process management is an important area of study in business. So what they're trying to do is to reduce the defects, reduce the failures. Because when production produces fail, failed products, defects, that's a waste. It's a waste of the materials that have been used to make the defect but it's also a waste of machine time of personnel uh, it's it's a dead weight loss on the business so the company tries to eliminate defective production but of course by increasing customer satisfaction and decreasing waste it will increase its profits so the company sees a benefit in introducing business process management because it will generate profits, extra profits I should say. And there will be better morale amongst the, the staff who don't have to keep closing down the machinery and retooling and finding out what happened, why it went wrong and trying to fix it. Uh, if it's planned out carefully at the start, then the chances are it will be more effective over a long period of production. So there'll be better morale amongst the staff. Some of whom may be paid on a bonus basis, so they'll be extra happy. It'll lead to business excellence. And by business excellence here we mean the number of defects will be very, very small. The company will have rooted out the the, the issues that can cause defects. It will look critically at all its processes and try to synchronize them, try to get them running efficiently, look for areas that could fail and try to solve those issues before they happen. So it will lead to business excellence because the customers will receive a consistent product, a good quality product, they will receive it on time and they will be happy with the services of the business. 
So why six sigma? Well, in statistics, we use the concept of sigma um, quite a lot. It's denoted by the delta sign, which is in the brackets there, and this is a measure of the standard deviation. So if you can imagine a population, a population being in, in our case, let's say, uh, the amount of items produced in a day within a company. That's the population we're considering, the number of items produced. Now if we draw a sample from that, and let's say we draw the sample as randomly as we can. Uh, it's difficult to draw random samples, but if we could draw a random sample, then we would expect the sample to have the same characteristics as the population, providing it meets certain issues which are considered in statistical theory. And we have classes that deal with that. But essentially what we're doing is drawing a sample and comparing the sample to the population. And the sample should be representative of the population. So it should have, uh, it should be able to work out the mean of the population by drawing a sample. For normal distributions, a population average of mu, mu is the, the term in the brackets, mu will lie in the range of <coughs> the sample mean, x bar, plus or minus 1.96 sigmas. And that will have a 95% confidence level associated with it. So if the company is producing a lot of something, uh, a lot of items, uh, the production system producing a lot of them, and we draw a sample out of there, and we try to draw the sample as randomly as we can, and then we work out the average of the, the sample, and add and subtract 1.96 standard deviations, then we would have, we would be 95% confident that the, the sample mean is the same as the population mean. We'd be 95% confident the two coincide. Even though we haven't measured the population average, we can estimate by just drawing the sample. And that's the whole power of sampling. That's the idea behind sampling. So we multiply by 1.96. We're 95% confident that the sample mean will be the same as the population mean. For normal distributions with a population average mu will lie in the range x bar plus or minus 2.54 uh, sigmas, will be 99% uh, confident that this is the case. You see, what we've done here is we've <coughs> we've widened the interval. We've said we've worked out the pop the sample average x bar. We're multiplying now by a bigger figure, 2.54, as opposed to earlier 1.96. Now we're multiplying by 2.54 sigmas. So we have widened the interval. Uh, there's more variation. But we are now 99% confident that x bar will be in that range. Uh, sorry, x bar will coincide with the population mean, and it will be in that range. The population mean will be in the range x bar plus or minus 2.54 standard deviations. This is all dealt with in our classes on statistics. Uh, this is more more or less a, a revision of what we've got there. For normal distributions, the probability of falling in x bar plus or minus 6 sigma range is, is that figure there, 0.999966. So we have a very wide range. We have said uh, it's the sample average x bar plus or minus six times the standard deviation. That's a very wide range for the um, uh, for the population average to fall in. So therefore, because it's a wide range, we're more confident it will fall in there. We have a, a, a bigger catchment area, if you like. This is where 
um, applied to measuring production defects would be 3.4 defects per million units. That's all we've got, 3.4 defects per million units. So the chance of it falling the population average being different from the sample average is only 3.4 per million. If we add 3.4 to 0.9999966 we would we would make it up to 1. So it's just 3.4 defects per million. Now it's a very high and consistent and it's also low variability so it's uh, it's looking at almost no defects so if we were now in the company producing something and we took a sample of the output the end and worked out the standard deviation I multiply it by six plus or minus six standard deviations then we would say that there's only 3.4 defects per million that can happen in in that situation providing all of the production system is tuned up to to do its job correctly let's look at some terminology first of all this idea of defects per million opportunities assume we make uh, a thousand items uh, of output and let's say uh, these are components for the car industry or whatever components for for some particular item we make a we make a thousand of them let's further assume that each component may fail to meet the required standard in eight different ways so when we make a component it could fail in eight different ways we, we know how the components may fail they may fail in this case in eight different ways for example size tolerances fastenings we could work out eight different ways perhaps this product can fail other products may fail six times and others may fail ten times but let's say this particular product could fail eight different ways that means if we produce a, a thousand of them we have 8,000 opportunities for failure. Uh, if we produce a thousand and each one could fail in eight ways, then we have 8,000 opportunities for failure. Finally, let's assume that 25 items failed the tests. So we have 8,000 opportunities for failure, but only 25 items failed the test. Let's assume that. So we now use this formula. We have a million, because we're talking about defects per million opportunities, times the number of defects, in our case it would be 25, divided by the number of units, multiplied by the number of opportunities per unit. So if we put that into our formula, we have a million times 25. We say 25 have, 25 have failed the test. Um, the number of units was we made a thousand and the number of ways in which it could fail is eight so now we have it all comes down to twenty five uh, thousand over eight which is three thousand one hundred and twenty five so the defects per million opportunities is three thousand one hundred and twenty five in other words if you have a process running at six sigma you've almost eliminated all defects it's nearly perfect so if the company can work out all the ways in which a product could fail and try to take measures to stop it failing they are along the road of instituting Six Sigma philosophy they are moving towards eliminating defects of course the processes don't run at Six Sigma they run at 
let's say 5 sigma or 4 sigma or worse. Uh, here's the full scale to get an appreciation of the numbers involved. Say 5 sigma would be 233 defects per million opportunities. DPMO, defects per million opportunities. Or if you like, 99.98 defect free. 4 sigma, well, we get more uh, defects per million opportunities. Uh, it's 99.4% defect free. 3 sigma, the number of uh, DPMO, 66,807. That's 93.3% defective free. 2 sigma, 69.1% defect free. And 1 sigma is just 30.9% defect free. So you can see the recommendation for management is to try and eliminate defective processes. Try to get rid of the possibilities of defects. And the more successful they are in doing that, the more they move to Six Sigma. The, the more they move up the ladder, more defect free. So it's, it's their efforts in trying to eliminate the possibilities of defects that generates this idea of Six Sigma. As I said, <coughs> most companies will not be running at six sigma. They may be running at five or four sigma, uh, or even less. But if they have policies and processes, managerial processes, in place to try and eliminate the number of defective items produced, then they are moving towards six sigma. Six sigma is just 3.4 um, defects per million opportunities. 3.4. We start at 5 sigma, we can see it's 233. So 6 sigma is a big ask. It's a big requirement. And it would take a lot of effort on the management side to try and eliminate all defects, to try and get up to that standard. So Six Sigma is a very demanding uh, policy. There are calculators we can get to uh, to work these out for us because the figures do get a little confusing and the, the figures are also quite big. You, you can find them online. You can do a search online for Six Sigma calculators and um, the chances are you'll bring up some. This is one I found uh, in the preparation of these notes. Um, we'll talk about it in a second, but uh, you can see uh, if we just change some of the the figures here, we can see what's happening overall. I'll, I'll explain what the, the various terms mean in a moment. But um, here are the opportunities per unit. I changed it from one up to two. Um, talks about the defects and then it gives the results at the bottom and you can see how the variations work. Um, the sigma shift column, well that's always set at 1.5. Um, it was first applied by Motorola and they calculated the difference between short and long run data to be 1.5. So we 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 insert 1.5 in there. Um, the yield is the percentage of a process that is free of defects. So the uh, you can see that the the number the yield has on the uh, calculator on the right. The yield is 99.6, whereas on the left it's 99.32. And the reason for that is if you look at defects higher up on the same calculator, uh, the defects on the left is 34 and the defects on the right is 20. So there are less defects 
on the calculator on the right and therefore the, uh, the yield is better 99.6 Six Sigma applies not only to product quality but also to all aspects of business operation by in improving key processes so we think about it as something that's applied to production and in fairness that's where most of the the notes and most of the discussions seem to be based but it could be applied to any process within the business uh, processes can fail for various reasons and the opportunities for failure should be identified if they are properly identified and action is taken to reduce the possibility of failure then the organization in total is becoming more defect free they are moving towards Six Sigma many companies have adopted the Six Sigma philosophy including uh, some of the really big names many companies think it's a very onerous task and don't really apply themselves to uh, working it out and, and thinking along these lines but having said that most companies will try to eliminate errors and defects and insofar as they're doing that they are moving towards less defective production which means closer to the Six Sigma ideal they may not be targeting Six Sigma but they're moving in that direction the very fact that they are trying to fix the number of defects they're moving in that direction these companies the ones listed here they have adopted the Six Sigma philosophy because they believe that it will help them increase market share decrease costs and grow profit margins simply by producing a better product is it gives the customer a better experience the customers are happier with the product so the company should have greater market share enjoy a better reputation more sales costs should fall as well because there are less uh, issues within the business of dealing with defective production um, so errors are reduced which will reduce costs more sales less costs profits will grow so some companies are highly committed to this type of philosophy because they believe it will give them a better market presence so the companies in short they see a link between quality and profits now businesses need to verify what they claim the best way to do this is to measure and analyze um, they only need to do this if they're stating this is an objective perhaps to the shareholders or to the wider business community uh, internally the fact that they are rooting out defective production and bad practices means that they are even quietly without saying it they're moving towards the Six Sigma ideal the Six Sigma approach is to use metrics to measure and calculate success or failure it's not guesswork they're, they're trying to actually work out what can go wrong fix it before it goes wrong and institute policies that will mean that it's fixed for all times it's not just a one-off fix and then they move on to the next issue that could fail try to fix that and uh, set up routines that means that there's less likelihood of failure at that part and again that's adding to the movement towards Six Sigma no defects or very few defects in fact the Six Sigma as I, as I said earlier is just 3.4 defects per million it's almost perfect the Six Sigma methodology measures processes to change processes so it's it's measuring processes but it's measuring them to change um, uh, the processes themselves it's it's looking critically at the processes it's not accepting that because they've got a process that's the best way there may be other tweaks 
or changes to the process that will result in an even better process. And the even better process will have less defects, again, moving them in the way they want to go. Now, three important aspects of Six Sigma. Well, business process management. This is the design and uh, efficiency of processes and is the responsibility of senior management. So, this is the design and efficiency of processes. It's trying to look at what the company does and the way it goes about achieving its objectives, or goes about how to achieve the production objective. What's the efficiency of the process? And it's looking critically at those processes on a continuous basis, not just a one-off, continuously trying to find better ways in which to work and better ways to generate efficiencies. Secondly, um, a scientific approach is used to define and measure problems. They're not guessed. They, they are measured, measured properly and scientifically. Analyzing root causes, trying to find out what caused them, not just the fact that something has broken down or something is not working and just try to patch it and put it back together. Find out why did it break down, what caused it, and see if something more significant is causing the issue and trying to fix it so that it's less likely to cause a problem in the future. And so also testing theories of improvement. Sometimes there are recommendations that come through from any part of the organization, come, could come through from the shop floor, maybe even suggestions uh, coming in from the outside that, that um, particular processes should be conducted in a certain way. Well, the company may spend some time testing the theory to see if it does generate improvements. And this is the meth methodology used in Six Sigma to improve effectiveness and efficiency. Constantly focusing on these type of areas. There's also a cultural component of Six Sigma. All employees at all levels within the company must embrace and apply the method methodology to ensure a successful outcome. So in other words, everyone's involved. It's not just the management trying to find the issues, but uh, everyone within the business should be looking towards bringing about better solutions, eliminating waste, eliminating the possibility of defect, um, proposing changes which will enhance production, enhance the throughput of the business, enhance the f overall efficiency of the business. Six Sigma focuses on processes and aims to bring about business improvement through systematic analysis of business data. It's, as I said earlier, it's not based on guesswork. It's based on the data that the business has collected. It systematically analyzes the data to see where there are issues, where uh, trends were, were distorted, or where figures, unusual figures may have arisen, and it then calls into play a more detailed inquiry into what happened, uh, what's going on, and to see if improvements can be made and the defects eliminated. The key feature is improving one process at a time. They don't go about trying to fix everything at the same time. They focus in on one, fix it, get it right, eliminate the defects arising from that process, then move to the next one, do the same. So it's quite systematic, it's quite focused, one at a time, so there's clarity in what they're doing to make sure that each defect, each opportunity for a defect has been reduced or eliminated. The process could be a production system, a payroll, or the logistical system. In fact, it could be any system within the, the business. It could be in the account section, or it could be in the marketing section, where there are the possibility of errors, errors in collecting data or the interpretation of data 
or errors in, in making customer contact. Uh, there are lots of ways in which errors can creep in right across the organization. And it's looking systematically at the elimination of those possibilities. That is the focus of Six Sigma. A process can be defined as a series of activities that takes an input, adds value to it, and produces an output for the customer. So that's what a process is, very simply. It, it takes inputs. If we take any company, it takes, let's say it takes the raw material in. It adds value to the raw material by processing it. And in so doing, it produces an output, which is passed back to the customer. Now, that's a very simplistic way of looking at it. But then there, within the production process, there are opportunities for failures. And it's looking at each one of those and fixing each one. That's the focus of Six, uh, Six Sigma, trying to eliminate the opportunities for failure. There are many ways of modeling processes. One of the most widely is SIPOC, the Supplier Input Process Output Customer Diagram. So it's Supplier Input Process Output. Let's have a look at the diagram. Uh, the SIPOC diagram is one of the most useful models for business and service processes. The acronym uh, we've got there is made up from supplier, the person or group that provides the resources for the process. Those are the suppliers, they supply the resources. The input, the resources used in the process, machinery, um, personnel, um, logistics, inputs, uh, stores, whatever it is, there are inputs. Then the process, the transformation of inputs into outputs with value, da value added. This may be a production process. And then output, the final product of the process. And the customer at the end. The customer is the person that drives the whole um, exercise. If there are no customers, it won't happen. So it's the person or group our production destination that receives the output. That is the customer. So we have supplier, input, process, output, customer. So that is very simply, but nonetheless very accurately, uh, a portrayal of many companies' processes. The supplier, the input, the process, the the activity of, of making whatever it is or doing whatever it is, then the output, whatever comes out of that process, and the customer to whom the product goes. For example, forestry managers and owners, these could be the suppliers, well they supply wood, wood is an input, and that goes to a process which is a paper mill, that's the process, and the output is paper, paper mill produces paper and the paper is then passed to the customer who may be publishers of books or of newspapers magazines whatever it is so we see very simply the whole process set out and we need to ensure that we're focusing in on the the process part to look for errors within the business possibilities of failure within the business so that that process from supplier to customer is as smooth as possible and as efficient as possible. Use of Six Sigma process um, improvement strategy requires the use of a five-stage process. These five stages are define the problem and customer requirements. Now, this is the nitty-gritty of the Six Sigma process. So define the problem. What is the problem? Try to identify it and try to look at the customer requirements. Customers may want a product which is uh, no errors whatever or they might be prepared to take a little 
uh, they may have some sort of tolerance limits. The, the ideally wanted of a certain specification, let's say, but they're prepared to take plus or minus a little. And providing it doesn't go outside of those parameters, they're willing to accept the product. So define the problem and define the customer requirements. Then measure the defects and process operation. Work out how many defects per million are there. And try to understand the, the process and the operation to try and reduce those defects so that the customer is receiving a consistent product every time. Analyze the data and discover causes of the problem. It's not based on guesswork, as I said earlier. It's based on hard data analysis. Try to pick up the statistics, the number of failures, the opportunities for failures, what's been happening. Look at it, analyze the data, and try to work out what is it that's going wrong, and try and fix it. But don't just fix it on a one-off. It's a, a long-term fix so that then the management can go and focus on another area of failure and fix that. So overall the organization is becoming more defect free. In other words, it's moving towards the Six Sigma ideal. Improve the process and remove causes of defects. Well, that's having analyzed the data, the next logical step is to fix the problem and try to fix it, as I said, not as a one-off, but as a, a permanent fix. Control the process to avoid concurrent defects. So when a process is doing more than one thing, make sure that they are not producing um, concurrent defects. Try and control the process so there's clarity about what the process is doing and if issues arise because the process is producing defects elsewhere, then focus in, deal with that, get it solved. The five-step step strategy is called DMAIC. Define, measure, analyze, improve, control. So this is when the process is running. It's this is managerial intervention. Because the process is running and the management want to uh, eliminate defects, to focus in on different parts of the running process to try and get permanent fixes. And this five-step strategy is called DMAIC. Define, measure, analyze, improve, control. The goal of Six Sigma is to achieve high uh, Six Sigma levels of quality. Um, it's, it's not really to do that, I should say. It's, it, the goal is not really to, to do that, but it's, it's to bring about improvements and profitability. You see, Six Sigma is really an ideal. Uh, some may achieve it, but it's, it's a, a very big ask, as I said earlier. It's a very big requirement. It's a very big uh, thing to try and do to try to almost eliminate all defects in production, all defects in the management and running of a business. Uh, very, very complex thing and very, uh, very difficult. So companies are, generally speaking, in a, in a more practical way, not trying to achieve necessarily the ideals of Six Sigma, the 3.4 uh, million, sorry, the 3.4 defects per million opportunities. They are instead um, trying to eliminate issues and defects and improve their performance. And in so doing, they're moving towards Six Sigma. It doesn't mean that if they haven't achieved Six Sigma, they're going to close down. It just means that they are edging towards it all the time. That's the idea. The idea is, on a continuous basis, they're looking for improvements, looking for ways to improve their performance, uh, ways to eliminate defects and, and faulty uh, production or faulty issues within their productive system. 
the, as I said, this may not be just in terms of production. It may be in terms of uh, the the back offices. It may be in terms of marketing or accounts or administration or whatever it is. Just trying to fix each problem, but fix it so it's fixed almost permanently. Uh, that's a big statement in itself because it's difficult to fix something permanently. But fix it, try to fix it long run and then move on to the next one and try and fix that. And in so doing, all the time they're moving towards less defects, more efficiency, better uh, customer experience with the product, better reputation, and also they're not wasting resources on uh, remaking products that have failed because the, the products are not failing as much. So there's less cost and hence, of course, more profitability. It's also claimed that the profit margin increases from 3 sigma to 4.8 sigma uh, are dramatic and that 8.4 sigma companies require uh, a redesigning of processes known as design for 6 sigma, DFSS. So, profit margins increase as, as a consequence of eliminating the defects. And this means that the companies are constantly trying to design for Six Sigma. So if they're designing a new product or going to open a new part of the business, before it solidifies into an actual department, say a production department, the management should take, make every effort, I should say, to try and eliminate defects or the possibility of defects. They should carefully look at what they're proposing to make sure that it would be as much error-free as is possible. So what they're doing is they're designing for Six Sigma. Before it happens, they are designing for it. Um, at 4.8 sigma, further improvements may be impossible given the current uh, production configuration. So sometimes companies are uh, running at very high standards of efficiency and it's very difficult to make further improvements. Um, in that case, management are usually waiting for a defect to happen so that they can uh, get involved and try and fix that one. But if, it's, if they've already rooted out a lot of the problems, then it's difficult for them to continue to monitor something that's going correct because that's almost a waste of resource. So when they're running at very high levels of efficiency. It's a question of monitoring the production system in lines with, with what they have discovered. But the investigative part, which will lead to improvements, that may be scaled down slightly. So it's a question of maintenance as opposed to inquiry, simply because they are running at such levels of efficiency. The returns may not justify it. The process may require a total redesign in order to achieve high sigma scores. This design approach is known as design for six sigma. Now, this is when a company perhaps has a lot of errors and instead of trying to fix each one, it might be better to simply start and design for six sigma. Design, redesign the whole production system. That may mean new equipment, more investment, retraining of staff, um, but they are designing for Six Sigma rather than fixing the old system part by part, which may take a long time and whilst they're doing it, customers have become more alienated, the reputation of the business is sinking. It might be better to simply throw over the old system and start afresh. Design for Six Sigma is recommended when a business chooses to replace rather than repair one or more core processes. So, as I said, 
the business may look at uh, the areas of failure and think it's going to take too long, it's going to take too much resource to try and fix each part of it, bit by bit. So instead of that, simply invest in new machines, more training, more efficiency, and replace rather than repair. Research shows that existing processes will never deliver the level of quality customers are demanding. That's a, quite an interesting statement, because uh, there will always be some term, some types of variation. Uh, in production systems, when uh, in engineering, for example, um, no matter how hard uh, production systems try to produce standard products, there will be slight variations, there will be tolerances. They'll work as close to the ideal as they can, but because machine parts wear out and because um, there will be variations in uh, the, the efficiencies of the machines, there will always be some variations. So the customers will always have to accept that there will be slight variations. It will never be exactly what they are required. Um, of course, the onset of um, computer-aided manufacturing systems and more monitoring um, within the production systems due to more advanced technologies um, means that that statement may change over time. It may be that eventually customers will get exactly what they wanted. And there are lots of quite exciting developments in production um, which may lead on to uh, a better customer experience. The business identifies an opportunity to offer an entirely new product or service. In this case you are designing for Six, uh, six Sigma because it's, it's a new product or a new service. So the, the company is starting from scratch. So, in so doing, they should factor in immediately the Six Sigma ideal and try to make sure that what they're investing in will be as error-free as possible. There's no point in investing in processes that will have a lot of defects. So they are designing for Six Sigma right from the start. Now, design for Six Sigma is an investment decision and its return will be over the life of the product. So it's trying to get good investment decisions, uh, investment decisions will, which will lead to fewer defects and less errors, and it will make a return on the investment which should be um, a good return on the investment because of less errors and less production problems. and that return will be over the life of the investment. And that has to be compared with something which is perhaps more prone to break down or producing defective items, which may be a cheaper investment decision. But the management has to decide which one is better. And generally speaking, because the reputation of the business is at stake, customer experiences need to be taken into account. Um, the design for Six, Six Sigma should be built in from the start and investment decisions should be based around achieving that objective. If we look at the process implementation and monitoring, we have the process design, which would be the research part. The, the company is looking to um, uh, develop a new uh, production system. So the, the researching perhaps looking into producing something. Then they will design whatever it is and the process moves from research to design. And then from design into development and development into production. Now if we just draw a line across uh, at the point in which development becomes production then 
designed for Six Sigma concentrates on this section there, the one indicated there. That's designed for Sigma. That, that's before anything has happened. They, they are looking towards the elimination of errors right from the start, during the research phase, during the design phase, during the development phase. They are factoring in the reduction of errors and the achievement of Six Sigma. It's designed for Six Sigma. Now Six Sigma itself concentrates on the production section. So the design for Six Sigma is, in a sense, before production takes place. Once it's actually the investment is made and the, the processes are running, then it becomes Six Sigma. The, the management then will look at each failure independently and see what caused the failure, uh, why was it a defect, um, try to take uh, remedial measures to try and correct it, and measures that will have long-lasting uh, effects on the business. In other words, they don't have to go back to fix that same thing next week or, or next year or whatever. It, it will be fixed and hopefully fixed correctly for as long as the process runs. So that will free up the management then to look at the next failure. And this is the, the normal Six Sigma process. In the early stages, it's designing for Six Sigma. It's trying to get the right machines, the, the right training, trying to decide on what is best. So as when the investment is made, there will be no errors. It will be Six Sigma. So that's during the research, design and development. During the production stage, when all of the investment has been made, they will then focus on individual failures or defects and try to sort those out. So we can see there, there are differences. Um, so the design for Six Sigma runs across that red line I've indicated there. Everything up to the point where production starts is designed for Six Sigma and after that it becomes Six Sigma, looking at individual failures. Before that point it's designing so that it doesn't happen, getting the right machinery, the right training and so on. The objective of DFSS is to design it right the first time. Get it right so there is no need for Six Sigma intervention, trying to eliminate errors later. It's designed out. The errors are designed out of the process. It works within set budgets and anticipates design vulnerabilities. So it's constantly looking at, when investments are proposed, looking at ways in which this investment can fail. Products may um, be produced with defects. It looks at those and tries to make sure that the investment that is ultimately made by the business will be free from those possibilities, as, at least as much as possible. Design for Six Sigma may be defined as a systematic me methodology for designing and redesigning products or services according to customer requirements and expectations. And that's important because it's important that the customer's expectations and requirements are central to the whole process. That's why the business exists, to, to supply the customers with the products that they want. So their specifications should be clearly understood and then their specifications should be fed into the design for Six Sigma phase so that the most appropriate machinery and techniques are purchased in to the business to enable the business to produce the products that meet the requirements of the customers exactly meet the requirements of the customers, but also minimize the, the possibility of failure later on. The DFSS uh, methodology begins uh, by finding and analyzing inefficiencies in processes that are neg negatively affecting a product's sigma performance. So. Design for Six Sigma methodology begins by finding and analyzing inefficiencies. 
they are looking critically at uh, the types of machinery, the types of equipment that they need, and how that equipment or machinery may fail. And they are being critical about the purchases. They're not overwhelmed by the technology or impressed by whatever the, the, the machines or the equipment can do. That is not what they're focusing on. What they're focusing on is ways in which the investments that they're about to make may fail. And if they can't find ways in which they fail, the chances are these are the most appropriate pieces of kit for the organization to purchase. It also looks at redesign issues arising out of customer responses. Customers feedback to the business and say um, the recent purchases were not quite what they expected because there were uh, errors involved or there was issues on the use of the product or whatever it is. And these feedbacks are taken seriously by management who will uh, initiate investigations into why this happened and try to fix the issues. Again, this is the normal process of Six Sigma, but they will fix them in a way that they do not arise in the future. So it's not just a one-off fix. This is a fix which is permanent. And that issue should not arise in the future. Other issues may arise, but not that one. And if other issues arise, they should be dealt with in the same way. The process of solving uh, problems is called DMADV. Define, measure, analyze, design, and verify. So define, measure, analyze, design, and verify. It's also called PIDOV. Plan, identify, design, optimize, and validate. The uh, anagrams are very difficult to remember and to uh, to work out, but they are meant to uh, trigger what what they what they mean. So, the the process of problem solving can be looked at in in these ways. Now, I stated earlier, the regular six sigma process uh, involvement strategy will use a five stage process. Now these five stages are define the problem, uh, problem and customer requirements. Stage one. Make sure there's a clear statement of the problem. This is the Six Sigma uh, process improvement strategy. So define the problem. Make sure there's, there's clarity about what the problem is. Exactly what the problem is. If there's no clarity there then it's a waste of time. They will be looking for problems that um, they're not sure what they're looking for. So there must be clarity about what the problem is. Measure the defects and process operation. Look at the number of opportunities for failure. So look at ways in which this, this problem can manifest itself and, and look for the various ways that it could fail. And look at the process that caused the problem to to fail. Look at the process operation. Analyze the data and discover causes of the problem. So look at the data, study the data, and try to discover the causes of the problem. Improve the process and remove causes of defects. So having done the analysis of the data, improve the process. Remove the causes of the defects. But remove them so they're removed permanently. And that process, that particular issue has been resolved. That should not arise again. Other, proce other problems may arise, but not that one. Control the process to avoid recurrence of the defects. And those are the five stages. Now this five-stage str uh, strategy is called DMAIC. Define, measure, analyze, improve, control. It's just the first letter of, of the first word uh, in each of the points. 
Define, measure, analyze, improve, control. Now, the, the difference between DMAIC and DFSS. Well, the design measure um, approach, the one we just looked at, is aimed at reacting. This is when the problem has arisen. Now, the management is reacting to it. It's detecting and resolving the problems. But the problem has already arisen. In contrast, the design for Six Sigma, DFSS, is more proactive in searching out inefficiencies and anticipating problems. So one is after the problem arises, the first one, DMAIC, and DFSS is trying to rule out the possibility of problems right from the start, right from when production process was first designed. They were trying to eliminate the possibility, possibility of errors. So we can see one is reacting, detecting, and resolving problems. The other is uh, trying to rule out the problems right from the start, before the production process even came into existence. They were factoring in in their equipment purchasing decisions, uh, looking for problems that could arise and trying to factor these out of the equation. DMAIC is for products or services that already exist, whereas DFSS is for the design of new products, services or processes. So one is when the organization is actually running and fixing the, the problems as they arise. The other is for, it's more in the planning sphere. They are planning production of a certain type and they are designing uh, the production process to be as error-free as possible. And three is DMAIC is based on manufacturing processes and DFSS is concerned with marketing, R&D and design. So different issues. They are DFSS is also dealing with manufacturing issues as well I should say but but it's also concerned with marketing or in the design it's it's looking at the whole process of making the product but nothing has happened this is just the the business at the early stages of planning production of a certain type of product whereas the DMAIC is looking at one which is already set up and which may be reducing producing issues Financial benefits of DMAIC can be quantified more quickly with benefits uh, from DFSS being more long term. So if the production system is already established and there are errors and problems that involve managerial intervention, then once the, the problem is fixed, then that should show up as a benefit straight away. Whereas DFSS is dealing with situations that have not occurred yet. This is just the planning phase. So there are no obvious benefits in the planning phase because nothing is happening. It's planning. The machinery may not have been purchased. The personnel may not have been trained. So it's just the planning phase. So there is a difference between short run and long run. DMAIC is short run get involved, fix the problem now, make sure it's fixed permanently and the customer is getting a better experience. And the benefits of that can be felt almost immediately. With DFSS, it's planning the proper investment which will be as error-free as possible. Uh, that's just a table of different yields and um, defects per million and, and so on. It's just a, a table that um, might be of interest uh, later on. It's, it's slightly different from what I've just been talking about, but I just inserted it in because um, the table was easy to calculate. I've, I've highlighted 6 sigma, 5 sigma and 4 sigma just uh, to show what the um, the errors are and and so on. 
This is a long class. Uh, we've got to the end now, but it has been a long one. I hope you've stopped the video several times and made your own notes. It's a video well worth going back on because it is an important issue. Uh, companies do try to produce products which meet customer requirements and try to eliminate errors simply because errors cost, um, cost the, the company money. They increase costs because it's a waste of resource, it's a waste of raw material, it's a waste of time. Uh, it also alienates the customer and reduces the reputation of the business. And whilst companies may not achieve the Six Sigma ideal, by working towards it, fixing defects, uh, one at a time perhaps, or trying to design out the possibility of defects, as in design for Six Sigma, uh, they are moving the business towards that ideal. So that's the, the whole point of the Six Sigma. Having said all of that, it's time to leave the video, so thank you for watching.